a long story short, the Battle of Hundred Years' War, within seven years, well, as, uh, as for the King Charles VII, thanks to the fire that Joan had built and the confidence that the, for the people of France had in the French army, Charles was able to pick his fights. Now, he was, he was a very intelligent man in some way, but basically he, he looked around at the French army, would pick the weakest part of the French army and whip them. They look around for another part, and as he, every time he whipped a French uh, army, or every time he whipped an English, every time he whipped an English army, he would get another duke on his side, and within seven years he had the Duke of Burgundy on his side. The Duke of Burgundy was one who had captured Joanne in the first place. But in seven years he got the Duke of Burgundy on his side and the Duke of Lorraine. They were the two most powerful dukes in France. When he did this, the English might as well have gone home. In 1453, the Hundred Years' War ended, and 1453 is often called, and of all the few dates you'll see, you'll see this one, at least some of you will on the test. Two things happened in 1453 that is often made 1453 called the dividing line between medieval and modern. The Hundred Years' War ended, and that was the year that the Turks captured Constantinople. Two things. Now, again, 1500 is a more of a round number, and you're, that's well, why your book ends in 1500. But uh, of course, in 1492, uh, several things were about to happen. Um, in 1492, Columbus discovered America. In uh, 1521, Martin Luther led the Protestant Reformation. The whole, and basically, the whole world was about to change. And uh, Joanne was, she only lived 21 years. But she might have been largely influential in a lot of these changes. Charles VII lived to be an old man, and on a, from, well, give me a personal note, I told you how he felt dominated by a woman. He wound up having a mistress, and she was more domineering than Joanne had been. But uh, he, he, he took her in a mistress. But he lived to be a, an old man, and um, he passed the throne on to his son. He probably died not knowing for sure if he was the real son of the former king or not. And like I say, today if we go up both parties and check the DNA, we might be able to, we probably would be able to determine this, but even after all this amount of time. But uh, again, he didn't know, we don't know. Alright. Um, now the old nobility were being, was being weakened, the peasants' revolts, the plagues, the plagues were still going on. And all, during all this time, the Black Death was still some part of a problem. But, thanks to a lot of this, kings were able to build up a lot of their power. And um, eventually, I mean, this was good because um, where this was to lead was to, to powerful nations coming in in Europe. All right. The Byzantine Empire, thanks to the Fourth Crusade, the Byzantine Empire was greatly weakened, and Mehmet II, the Muslim leader, Mehmet II, Turkish man, he was the one who finally whipped the Muslim, I mean, he finally defeated the Byzantine Empire. And uh, when I read a book about this in high school at the fall of Constantinople, they called him Mohammed II, but today you, this, your authors call him Mehmet II as opposed to Mohammed. The king's name, who was the emperor of uh, the Byzantines, was a king named Constantine, Constantine XI. And when Constantinople was about to fall, he said, I will not be an emperor without an empire, and he rushed out to, for the battle to fight. His body was never truly identified. Uh, they bought in and finally they cut off a head and said it was him, but nobody knew for sure it was or not because they never, they never found the emperor once he rushed out to actually go fight among his own troops. But um, Constantinople was captured in 1453. The Byzantine Empire came to an end. The Ottoman Empire was created. The Ottoman Empire was destined to last until World War I when that one came to an end also. Um, all right, uh, about to run out of time. The church. 
with all respect to the church, the church was in need of reform, badly so. And um, the church suffered a few setbacks. Um, particularly, one of, the thing, uh, one of the things that got the church going in the first place was when the plagues would break out in the Roman Empire, people who were Christians would stay with the sick but when the Black Death came, the clergy fled like everybody else. The priests who were supposed to have comforted the sick or stayed with a sick family would take off running like everybody else. Maybe you can't blame them, but uh, bottom line is the Black Death did a lot to weaken the power of the church. But then came a big loss for the church. Boniface II, when Pope Boniface VIII, Pope Boniface, tried to tell King Philip IV what the king could and could not do. King Philip sent an army to capture Boniface. Boniface fled, but he was so upset that he died of a broken heart shortly afterward. Uh, this greatly diminished the pow power of the papacy. Well, the uh, king, Philip IV, moved the popes out of Rome and moved into a place in France called Avignon. This is called the Babylonian captivity of the papacy. Now in the Bible, the Babylonian captivity of Judea had lasted 70 years. The Babylonian captivity of the popes in Avignon was destined to last 70 years. During that time, um, the popes ruled from Avignon. They would issue decretals. They would act like popes in a lot of ways, but they quit telling the kings of Europe what to do. So their power was greatly reduced. Now, folk, again, I've got to emphasize, one reason Europe forged ahead was it separated church from state. In the case of the Byzantine Empire, the church and state were one. The emperors always appointed the patriarchs and the high church officials. Well, Europe did not allow that. The church appointed its own officials. I mean, uh, so basically, the ch church and state became separate. And um, throughout Latin America, during much of its history, church and state have been one. And one and the same, and that may be one reason why Latin America has not excelled. Those of you who are from Latin America, I mean, I'm stating the facts, folks, just as best I understand. If you want to argue, go ahead. But anyway, Latin America has not excelled, partly because they have not separated church from state, but Europe did. But anyway, but first they had to, the, the, the state had to put the church in its place and set the church down. You might say, hey, there's certain things you can and cannot do, and one of the things you cannot do is tell us as kings what to do. And folk, what we need in this country today is a president of the United States who tells the courts, I'm not going to obey you. When any little rinky-dink judge can tell the president what they, he can't do, what he wants to do. I mean, if it's the Supreme Court, that's one thing. But you get the Ninth Circuit stopping the president in his tracks, I think we've gone too far. If you get to where some local magistrate or some local judge is going to tell, or some justice is going to tell the president what he can and can't do. We're going to need some president who will stand up and say, enough. And right now our presidents are afraid to do that, afraid of being impeached. But eventually, the courts are going to step too far. And in this case, same thing, the church went too far. Well, 70 years went by. And finally, a pope was elected. And this pope said, I'm going back to Rome. So the new pope went back to Rome. Don't worry about his name. Well, a bunch of people at church were dissatisfied. No, the pope should be at Avignon. So they elected another pope. And now the church had two popes. This is what's known as the Papal Schism. schism. The church had two popes now, each of them hurling curses at each other and excommunicating each other. In other words, it was a big scandal in Europe. Well, finally, people of Europe said, well, now, wait, now, we got to get this resolved. So, uh, so to make a long story short, they elected another pope thinking the other two would quit, so instead the other two would not quit, so now we have three popes, two in Rome and one in Avignon. Well, this was a big scandal. 
So finally, the Holy Roman Emperor got involved, and he said to one of the popes, call an ecumenical council, and this time we all promise that whoever you pick will accept. Basically, again, you pick the pope. Or the emperor did not pick the pope. So that they, one of the popes, Pope John XXIII by name, I know you're going to say, wasn't John XXIII in the 20th century? Yeah, we had two 23rds. One back in the 1400s and one in the 1900s. But yeah, we had two John XXIII. By the way, there was no John XXIII. They didn't keep their history account very well. We went directly to Pope John XIX to Pope John XXI. And uh, they skipped the 20th. So anyway, Pope John XXIII called a council. The council, they elected a pope. And all of Europe's nobility, all of Europe's princes, all of Europe's royalty recognized a new man as pope. And finally, the other three retired. The church was destined not to have another pope resign until the year 2013 when uh, Pope Benedict XVI resigned. It was the first time a pope had resigned in 600 or so years. But anyway, uh, the other three resigned. The new pope made cardinals out of all three men. He tried to you know, ease their feelings of loss, and also as cardinal, they had a chance to step up and be a pope again. None of them did. And in those days, life was somewhat short. All four men, the three popes and the new pope they elected, Martin V by name, were all dead within five years. Um, Again, this was the way life was back then. But the papal schism had done a lot to become an embarrassment to the church and to uh, greatly um, diminish the prestige of the church and the papacy and ultimately pave, pave the way for the Protestant Reformation that was to come within a hundred years after this. Um, okay. All right. That pretty much covers everything, but I wanted, I'll, I'll spend the rest of the time that we have here reviewing. Um, all right, from what I remember about what the, uh, let's see, what, what's, what I remember. All right, backing up a little bit, okay. Backing up quite a bit. Um, who was the Pope who built the, made the calendar that we still use to this day? Gregory. Pope Gregory the Great, yeah, building a calendar that we still use to this day. Who is the Pope who persuaded Attila the Hun not to attack Rome? Attila who? Who Attila the Hun, who, who was one of the popes, Leo, went out Leo. and taught Pope Leo, persuaded Attila the Hun to not attack Rome. Now, um, who was the Babylonian king who carried the kingdom of Judah captive to Babylon? Uh, not Emirabi, king... Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, famous for some stories about it from the book of Daniel. King Nebuchadnezzar. Pope Leo? Uh, carried, uh, Pope Leo? What did Pope Leo do? Pope Leo persuaded Attila the Hun, this Asian man, to not attack Rome. All right. Um, Muslims start their calendar from what event? The flight. The flight. The flight of Muhammad. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, uh, and it occurred in 6, the date is 622 CE. All right, um, 622 CE, all right. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, um, Nebuchadnezzar, I'm sorry. He captured Jerusalem. He captured Jerusalem and carried captive. Um, sorry about that. Folk. Anyway, he carried some um, folk to Babylon. Now, um, who was the uh, Persian king who allowed them to return back home? This goes back a ways, I know it. Back to August. Persian king who allowed them to return home was King. Cyrus the Great, thank you. King Cyrus the Great. Um, now, Greece. Who was the man who ran 26 miles to tell his people that they had won a big battle? He ran the marathon. Yeah, he ran from the marathon to Athens. Yeah, he ran the marathon. Um, his name was Thudipides. Yes. Through Dipides. They had a commercial about him about 10 or so years ago. And it said to Thudip, oh, Thudip, sorry about that. You could have emailed. 
the voice on the commercial was obviously a black man's voice. But anyway, yes, you dip it easy if you wished you could have email. Let's see. All right. Um, you did it. Yeah, uh, let's see, uh, if I can... Fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, here it is. All right, um... Let's see, um... Yeah. Try to remember the difference between Romanesque and Gothic. Some of you see three questions about this, and there'll be uh, there'll be, there'll be uh, matching questions. Romanesque on the one hand, Gothic on the other. Um, all right, leaving that. Oh yes, one other question, and I'm, I'm now looking at the final exam. The Bulgars. Where did they originally come from? Before they settled in Bulgaria. Central. Asia. Central Asia. Yeah. Again, it wasn't just Mongolia, but also what is today Turkestan and <coughs> a few of those, a few of those places. Central Asia. New Jersey. Uh, again, those people would have more babies than they could handle with that climate and that land, and they were forced to squeezed out, just like in Arabia, that desert would they'd sometimes produce more people than they could handle, and they were eventually some of them were forced out. Now, um, let's see. Oh yes, what became, this is very important, what became the official religion of Russia? And I mentioned earlier, I couldn't separate church from state. What became the official religion of Russia? The Greek Orthodox. Greek and Orthodox. And talk about no separation of church and state. When the communists took over, Lenin appointed the Patriarch of Moscow. I mean, if you can imagine, Lenin didn't even believe in God, but Lenin appointed the Patriarch of Moscow. And during the 70 years when the communists controlled Russia, the Orthodox Church never rose up and protested one act of the communist government. Not one time. This is documented, folk. Um, that was Vladimir, wasn't it? Now, Vladimir was the man who, yeah, who uh, joined the uh, Orthodox Church, and when he joined, most of his people joined with him. Um, Oh yeah, I mentioned him last lecture. Who was the Israeli lawgiver? The Pharaoh? The, is the Israeli lawgiver. The, the, man, the, the man who gave the Jews their law. I mentioned him last oh, time. Uh, For, the black people should remember yes, him. Yes, Yeah, uh, because he was the black's favorite Bible character during the slave days. And I'll tell you in a minute why. Who, who was, was that, did anybody know? His name was Moses. Now, that was not, not why, why was Moses the black people's favorite Bible character? Anybody know? He was the one who freed the slaves. He went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go. Yeah, let my people go. Yes, and he freed the slaves and the, the blacks would gather around and they'd preach about Moses and talk about Moses. Yeah, he was their favorite Bible character. But he was a Jewish lawgiver. He was big in. Uh... All right. Um, okay. One reason why Buddhism did not remain. Why would Buddhism not remain so popular in India? Egalitarianism. Egalitarianism. The Buddhist is egalitarian. The Hinduism is not egalitarian. I did have a. Girl from India, tell me that Hinduism is egalitarian. Yeah, they'll tell you that when they're talking to one of us Westerners. Just like they'll tell you that they're monotheist also. Anyway, egalitarian. Hinduism is not egalitarian. Um, all right. Um, who was the first pagan king to convert to Roman Catholic Christianity? Um, Roman Catholic. Yeah, see, the Constantine converted to Arian Christianity. Justinian. Not Justinian, it was Clovis. 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 Yeah, see, all these Byzantine kings at first converted to Arianism. Eventually, Arianism completely died out. Now, this is something that some of you will see in the final, and I put it on your study guide. Arianism taught that Jesus was inferior to God, that he'd been created after God, and was not as strong as God. The Catholics and Protestants alike teach that Jesus was 
completely, fully, totally God and fully, totally man. Fully human and fully divine. That he was both. Um, that he had all of God's power and he had existed all the way back to the beginning with God. Uh, Arianism, though, um, is of all the beliefs that Christians hold, Arianism is one you'll hardly find among Christians anymore. But it was very strong back in the earlier days, particularly in the Middle East. All right, now this one you should know by now. Why did old maids tend to not die so much during the Black Death? Cats. They kept, they, they kitty, kept cats. kitty cats around. and uh, they, they couldn't feed the cats all the cats wanted, so the cats had to go out and hunt. And every morning they have cats, so even if they're well fed, they'll still hunt. Boy, and some of them just love to kill. Unfortunately, some of them, if you feed them too much, they don't care as much as you like them to. If you keep cats around, you can expect to not see very many snakes and not very many rodents around. They keep the rodents away, they keep the snakes away. Um, let's see. Um, Alright. Okay, who were the two Catholic monarchs? Who did? Uh, who drove? Finally drove the Muslims out of Spain. They're yeah, very famous in, in American history. Two Catholic monarchs who drove the Moors out of Spain, and, and the year was 1492. Isabella and Ferdinand. Ferdinand, yeah, I knew that. Ferdinand and Isabella, and they could not help Columbus until until they had finished the job of driving the Moors out of Spain. Ferdinand and Isabella, and. Um, Ferdinand was not interested in helping, but Isabella was a, had a bigger kingdom than her husband's. They both were independent monarchs. When they died, they passed the throne to their one son. Anyway, Ferdinand and Isabella. And, uh, let's see. Stupa. Stupas. What is the purpose of a stupa? What, what, what country are we talking about? That was India. 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 Little Buddhist, Buddhist monasteries. Buddhist places of holy sites where the Buddha had been. Yes, play holy places among Buddhists. Um, now, oh yeah, something I did not mention, it was on the study guide. Unfortunately, crusaders often turned on Jewish communities. And they would sometimes surround a Jewish community and set the Jewish community on fire and raise their hands and praise God hilariously while that the people inside were being burned to death or screaming their last breath. Uh, I mean, this is just an unfortunate fact, folk. But uh, I, I meant to mention it, but I am mentioning it now. And it's on a study guide for those of us. Uh, much too often, the Crusaders resorted to, uh, because they blamed Jews for uh, all the problems Europe was having. They blamed Jews for the Black Death, especially <coughs> since Jews did not get it as much as other people. And this made the people hate the Jews even more. <clears throat> the Jews wound up, now this is going to sound bad, they wound up fleeing to Poland, to Estonia, particularly Poland and East, what is today East Germany, to that region of Europe because there they found Haven. But this is basically setting them up for the Holocaust that came in the 1940s. Uh, but the, they all were for, fled England, fled France, fled Spain, and fled Portugal, and congregated around Poland. <clears throat> then the Polish people turned on them. And, uh, now, the Russians went into the communism. The Tsarist Russia was anti-Semite. When the communists took over, the communists were not anti-Semite. For whatever else you say about Stalin, when Stalin voted with Israel the United Nations, and Stalin condemned Hitler for his anti-Semitism, they were not anti-Semite. But anyway, this is some history that's you will run into it. It is important because anti-Semitism is making a comeback on the world scene. Um, I'm far, hard, hard against it. Very hard against it. Uh, so don't think that I'm encouraging it or not. Um, to me, it, it helps bring destruction on the people who practice it. Just ask Adolf Hitler if you could. All right. Um, two, oh, uh, never mind. Uh, Merlin, yeah, I think I mentioned Merlin. Merlin was whom? Wizard. He was a wizard. And what country? England. England. England, yeah, wizard in England. He was the one who helped Arthur become king of England. He, uh, sorry. 
in British folklore, his father was a fallen angel and his mother an earth woman. But uh, his mother went to church every, every time it was open. And uh, if Merlin became a Christian rather than becoming Satan's Antichrist, like Satan had hoped. That's the story. So Merlin became a good sorcerer, I mean, if you believe there is such a thing. All right. Um, what was the main difference between the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church? Number one difference. Well, according to my Catholic education, it was the infallibility of the Pope. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was the Pope. The difference is the Pope. The Eastern Orthodox do not recognize the Pope as being anything more than a Bishop of Rome. And I want to say about being Bishop of Rome, the first 400 years, that's all the Pope swore as Bishop of Rome. And our present Pope, when he first took office, said, I never want to forget that I'm first and foremost Bishop of Rome. So he still respects that title a bit. That he said, I'm Bishop of Rome first. And keep in mind, he was an Argentinian, not a... Italian, but he said, I, can, I always want to keep in mind I'm Bishop of Rome first and foremost. Uh, all right. Um, oh, yeah. The scholastics' favorite topic of study was. Theology. Theology. Oh, well, is that theology? Excellent, excellent. Good answer, but it's not one of the choices. They like to study the difference between faith and reason, but the main yes. man. Who, which man did they like the most? Aristotle. Aristotle. Oh, oh. 